Hello, uh, welcome to Unit 2 of uh, International Trade. I'm your host, Elias. Uh, in this video, we are going to look at the uh, growth and international trade. Now, what we have looked at so far is trade in the absence of growth. So we have looked at uh, how nations would trade and what would form the basis for that trade in the absence of growth. Now, if we assume that nations are now able to increase the labor units or the capital units or the resources in their production process, then what would happen to the volumes of trade? So let's uh, look at the outline. The first thing we'll look at is the dynamic factors in international trade and specifically we will look at growth and development. Then we will look at growth in factors as well as uh, technical progress. Now within the realms of technical progress, we will look at the capital or case saving technical progress, the labor or L saving technical progress as well as the neutral technical progress and then we will look at changes in factor supplies and technology as well as the trade and then changes in tests and trade and finally we will look at the dynamic factors in international trade for further readings you can find uh, the content of this unit in Salvatore chapter number seven so let's uh, begin uh, with uh, the dynamic factors in international trade, where we will look at growth and development. Now, we first need to know what economic growth is and what components make up uh, economic growth. Simply defined, economic growth is the change in the country's per capita real GDP from one phase to another. When we talk about real GDP, we are talking about the GDP that is adjusted for inflation. In other words, we are looking at GDP measured using constant prices or measured considering a given best year. Now, when we also talk about per capita, we are looking at the population as a whole. So this is the GDP that is captured with the population in mind and hence called the per capita real GDP. Simply measured, per capita real GDP is the ratio of real GDP divided by the population. In short, it is a ratio of real GDP to the population. Okay, so now it is usually expressed uh, with economic growth, meaning that we measure it as a, as a rate. So when we are looking at uh, economic uh, growth, we will capture it as a rate. So meaning when we get per capita real GDP and get its growth, then we will be measuring economic growth. And therefore it should be noted that the increase in GDP can be obtained in different ways, which will include the growth in factors as well as resources. So the factors, we talk about the labor, uh, the capital, and any other inputs that you are bringing into the production process. Okay, so now, uh, through time, a nation's population grows. Now we know if you consider Zambia, for example, that uh, in uh, 2010, we had a population of about 13 million. And now we are projecting a population of about 18 million, which means that over time, population grows. Now, in the growing of a given population, many fields that require the use of resources end up uh, growing and if you look at the resources themselves because they are scarce they tend to be in massive short supply but as the population grows we note that the labor also grows in other words the size of the labor force grows 
This is because from that growing population, there are many factors that lead to the growth of the labor force as people will be working hard to ensure that they uh, produce resources that are needed to at least achieve or meet the unlimited ones. As such, there is a direct proportion between population growth and the growth of the labor force. Now, because the labor has grown and all other resources are growing, then capital stock also increases due to the increased utilization of those resources in the production of capital equipment. Because for us to produce more, given the labor, we will need some machineries that will be coupled with the labor to produce resources. As such, in this unit, we will assume two major inputs, that is the capital and the labor, and then see what happens to the production process and therefore trade when any or both of the inputs change. Let's look at growth in the factors, which is the capital and the labor uh, themselves. We begin with the assumptions. Number one, we assume two nations, nation one and nation two, and we also assume two commodities, commodity X and commodity Y. The second assumption we make is that each nation produces both commodities, meaning nation one is producing commodity X and Y, as well as nation two is also producing X and Y. So X and Y are produced in either, in, I mean in both nations. Each nation is able to produce X and Y. The third assumption we make is that we are only using two inputs, the capital and the labor. Now you should note here that when we are talking about capital, we are looking at capital both in physical as well as, uh, if we look at physical capital, as well as the human capital. So when we are looking at the capital stock, uh, we will be talking about the physical as well as the human capital. That is the education, as well as, uh, that's the, in human, we look at the education and the health of uh, the labor force. Then in physical capital, we look at the actual capital stock that is brought into the production process. We assume uh, uh, that all units of labor are homogeneous and all units of capital are homogeneous. Meaning that if you remove some units of labor and replace them with other units, the production activity will not be affected. X is labor intensive and Y, while Y is capital intensive. What this means is that the production of commodity X responds more when you increase the labor units as opposed to increasing the capital, while the production of commodity Y responds more when you increase the capital stock or capital units as opposed to the labor. So if you wanted to, if you are living in a nation that produces a commodity that is labor intensive, Bringing in capital will take years and years for output to grow, but increasing the labor, you will notice that the production will respond quickly and therefore the production will improve. We also assume constant returns to scale, meaning that if we double each of the factor inputs brought into the production process, the output will also double. That is, if we triple the inputs, the output will triple. So if we have constant returns to scale, it means that whatever we do, and if we are uniform to all the inputs brought into the production process, in this case, the capital to the capital and to the labor, then our output will also follow suit to whatever action we take to the factor inputs. We assume that there is economic growth in our production process, meaning all resources can be improved, the factor, uh, factors of production can be changed, and so on. So we have economic growth. 
Okay, so let's now start our analysis by first looking at a growth in uh, both factors. Okay, so now if there is an increase in the endowment of labor and capital over time, it means that the nation's production possibility frontier will shift outward. Remember that where we are coming from, our PPF was drawn with assumptions that we, make that we made that technology was fixed. We also assumed the full employment, if you recall, resources were also fixed. Which means that this time around, if you expand your resource, uh, your endowment of factors, you expect your production possibility frontier to shift from this initial position where you assume fixed resources, fixed technology, you assume uh, two uh, units, two goods produced, and you also assume full employment, then it means you will be able to produce on a, a point outside the frontier. So the only way one nation can produce outside the frontier is by allowing economic growth to take place. So if the endowment increases and if the increment is uh, proportional, then we will have a shift in the production frontier outward. And uh, depending on how the units have been uh, improved, we may have a balanced or an unbalanced growth or simply called the biased growth. Okay, so with that, the, two, uh, the type and degree of the shift depend on the rate at which labor and capital grows, and if labor and capital grows at the same rate, the nation's production frontier will shift out evenly in all directions at the rate of factor growth, which then will mean that uh, if you draw the slope, uh, the line from the origin, and going to meet our production frontiers, we will have what we call the balanced growth. Let's look at a graphical illustration of this. So suppose that our initial production frontier is the black uh, production frontier, and that the nation is in Otaki at point A, where it's producing and consuming 50 units of X and 60 units of Y. And now that uh, this nation has a comparative advantage in the production of commodity X, it means that it will specialize in the production of commodity X and move along the frontier all the way to point B in the absence of growth. So meaning at point B, when you draw a, li a, tan a, a line which will be tangent to the frontier, you will notice that, that the slope at that point will be equal to the international terms of trade, which we have so far assumed to be one. And therefore, if you allow for growth on the other hand, and that you are doubling both your capital and your labor, it means that your production frontier will shift outward evenly. So because you have doubled your capital, it means that if you check the intercept here, where capital in the production of commodity Y, output of Y was produced, uh, 70 units were produced, now that you've doubled both your capital and your labor, Y, which is capital intensive, will double the output of Y to 140, and the X, which is labor intensive, will double the output of X from 140 to 280. So which means that when you draw a line and you want to continue producing at the international terms of trade, you will be producing at point B prime. And at this B prime, any ray that you will draw from the origin touching the two curves, so at this point and at that point, the slope will be the same. So at, what, at whatever point you draw the line, uh, line from the origin meeting the two curves, assuming it's a straight line, then where it touches the black frontier and the blue frontier, the slope will be the same. Therefore, such an improvement in the factor endowment is what we call the balanced growth model. Okay, so now let's look at uh, growth in both factors and uh, uh, the measure it in terms of factor productivity. Now, when both L and K grows at the same rate, as we have noticed from our previous graph, and we have constant returns to scale in the production of both commodities, the productivity and therefore the returns of labor and capital, which is the wage and the rental price of capital, will remain the same after growth as they were before the growth. 
What this leads us to is that we will also notice that if the dependency rate uh, remains unchanged, then real per capita income and the welfare of the nation will be unchanged. This is because you have doubled your, uh, your inputs and therefore your output has also doubled, which means that if uh, we have such a situation, your returns will be unaffected and therefore the productivity will be unaffected because uh, in our capital labor ratio, in our capital labor ratio, if you have doubled this uh, input capital and you also double the labor, it means the ratio will be unaffected and therefore their returns will be unaffected. For example, let's assume we had uh, three uh, up here and one here. The ratio, the whole ratio here will be 3. So 3 divided by 1 will be 3. And if we double each of these, we will have a 6 here divided by 2. So we've doubled each of the inputs. And again, we see that all this will still give us the 3, meaning the uh, returns will not, uh, the factor ratio will not change, and therefore their return and economic growth will not, I mean, uh, the uh, per capita income will not change. And this, therefore, will leave the welfare unchanged. Okay, so if the endowment of labor grows, the output of both commodities grow. Why? Because labor is used in the production of both commodities. And if L can be substituted for capital to some extent in the production of both commodities, it means that uh, the endowment of labor grows, the output of both commodities will still grow. So these two points justifies why the endowment of labor will lead to the growth in the endowment of labor will lead to the growth in output of both commodities. Let's uh, take a deep dive. So you will note that uh, the output of X, which is labor intensive, will grow faster than the output of Y because Y is capital intensive. So now that you have uh, improved or you have increased the endowment of labor, keeping capital constant, it means that then labor can be substituted for capital. So labor is coming in and capital is going out. And if we do that, we, have, we will notice that the amount of commodity X that will be produced will be more in the labor-intensive nation. Okay, so now let's uh, proceed with this and uh, see what we get. So the opposite will be true if uh, only the endowment of capital grows. That is, if the endowment of capital grows, then the output of Y will grow faster than the output of X because capital will be substituted for labor uh, to some extent in the production of both commodities. And as this process continues, more and more uh, Y will be produced and uh, uh, the growth will be more observed in the production of Y compared to X because the capital is what has increased and Y is capital intensive. We now tend to the unbalanced growth. Now, suppose that we only had uh, an improvement in one factor, like we have noticed that if labor grows, then output of labor will grow more than proportionate compared to the output of Y. Now, if you see this here, only one factor has grown, consider the solid blue line. If only labor has uh, improved, keeping capital constant, we will notice that the production frontier will shift and not it's just a tilt so there will be a shift in the production frontier to indicate that the output of both commodities will grow as a result of the increase in labor but what we notice here is that labor the growth in or the shift in the production frontier is more along the x-axis compared to the y-axis because x is labor intensive while y is capital intensive and because x responds more to labor the shift here will be more along the x-axis compared to uh, the shift on the y-axis on the other hand if capital is the one that improved 
uh, holding labor constant, then we will notice a shift in the production frontier, and this shift will be more along the y-axis and less along the horizontal axis because on the y-axis, commodity Y is capital intensive and therefore responds well to the changes in capital. Commodity X is labor intensive and responds less to the changes in capital. So if you compare these uh, points, the points of, uh, of uh, shifts, you will notice that uh, for commodity X, uh, when labor improved, the uh, growth on the X was more. So you see from 140 all the way to 275. Whereas when you look at this, the growth was only 10. And when capital improved, we notice a, an improvement from 70 all the way to 130. But this side, we only notice a shift of 10. Therefore, the, the commodity, which is intensive in the factor which has improved, receives a higher growth compared to the other commodity, which is less intensive. Now, if only L grows, uh, uh, that is, if only labor has grown or labor grows proportionately more than capital, it means that uh, the capital labor ratio will fall. This is because if you notice, if you look at this, consider our example where we had the 3 and 1. If this denominator here keeps on increasing, let's say to 2, it means that this number will have reduced from 3 to somewhere 1.5. And if this uh, L grows to 3, it means it will reduce down to 1. And if this labor grows to 4, then it means we are now reducing to 0 0.75. So the more the labor grows, it means that the, cap the whole capital labor ratio, holding capital constant, will be falling. And if the capital labor ratio is falling due to the increment in the volume or amounts of labor, it means the productivity of labor then will be dropping, will be falling. This is because now you have too much labor to use and a few capital units and therefore many labor units will be getting into each other's way just to make use of the, uh, the capital. And therefore it will be more profitable for the firm to release some of the labor units or pay them less for all those that are coming in. And this means that the returns to labor will fall, which means the wage, which is the payment to the labor, will be falling. And if the payment to labor is falling, it means that the real per capita income will also be falling. In general, if L grows or grows more than the growth in uh, capital, the capital labor ratio will fall and so will be the productivity, so will be the productivity of labor, the returns to labor, and the real per capita income. If, on the other hand, only the endowment of capital grows or capital grows proportionately more than labor with our initial capital labor ratio, so we have capital labor ratio. So if capital grows, if we assume that we hold labor constant, it means that given our initial example, 3 over 1, if this grows to 4, holding labor constant at 1, the whole ratio will be 4. If it grows to 5, holding labor at 1, the whole ratio will be 5. If this happens, it means that labor is becoming more and more valuable, and therefore, just to bring in fewer units of labor, the firm will be willing to pay more. This means that the capital labor ratio will rise, and so will be the productivity of labor and the returns to labor. Now, if the payments going to the labor units has improved, it means then that the real per capita income will also improve. Thus, if labor grows more than capital, the labor productivity falls, and if capital grows more than labor, the labor productivity improves. Let's now uh, state our Rybinski theory, which looks at the growth in factors and its effect on the output. 
The theory states that at constant commodity prices, which is the price of commodity X divided by the price of commodity Y, an increase in the endowment of one factor will increase by a greater proportion the output of the commodity intensive in that factor and will reduce the output of the other commodity. This means that if only L grows in nation 1, for example, then the output of commodity X, which is labor intensive, expands more than proportionate while the output of commodity Y, which is capital intensive, declines at the given uh, commodity prices. If you look at this, you will notice from our previous graph that uh, when we were looking at the growth in one factor, all we looked at is the overall picture of what would happen. So given that only labor has improved, then you will notice that the, we expect both uh, commodities to improve in terms of their output levels. But because of the international terms of trade and only one factor has grown, according to Rybinski theory, the output of commodity X in this case should improve by more uh, or rather more than proportionate compared to uh, what it was uh, before the definition of Rybinski theory or before allocating the international terms of trade. And as such, you will notice then that the production of Y will decline. So if at this point Y was at 20, then after growth in labor, the output of Y should reduce to somewhere be to any number below 20, while the output of Y over commodity X should more than double. So from 140, we expect to go and uh, uh, produce at a higher uh, level or uh, higher amounts. So let's get back to Rybinski theory. So we look at this uh, graphical illustration. So consider this graph where a nation is initially in uh, equilibrium in Otaki at point A. And because of its comparative advantage in the production of commodity X, the nation specializes partially in the production of X and meets uh, the international terms of trade at point B. And at point B, it means that this is a point where the nation has specialized and produced more of commodity X. So we notice that now commodity X, uh, 130 units are produced of X and 100 and, I mean, and 20 units of Y are produced. So you can compare this here. Let me just draw a, a rough line. Okay, so that's the, the production point after specialization. So you will notice that uh, the relative commodity price at this point is equal to 1, which is equal to the international terms of trade. Now, if only labor uh, doubles in the production of both commodities, remember that according to factor growth, the production possibility frontier will shift outward. However, the shift in the production frontier will be more along the axis of a commodity which is intensive in that factor and less on the axis for the commodity which is less intensive. Then according to Rybinski theory, it's, uh, the theory states that now that uh, we have improved, the, the, we have seen a growth in one factor, the output of the commodity which is intensive in that factor should more than double. Compare 130 here and the 270 here, which has been produced after the growth in labor. You will notice that double, if you double 130, you will end up uh, with 260. So then, because of what Rybinski brings in, the growth, the doubling in the input, which is uh, used in the production of that commodity, or which is a, a, uh, an input of intensity to the output, it means the output level of X should more than double. So we are moving from 130 to 270, which is more than double. The theory also states that the output of the other commodity, which is less intensive, should decline. And you will notice that at point M, the production of Y has now dropped to 10. So meaning, the due to the, in in to the doubling of labor, the production of X has more than doubled, while the production of Y has reduced. 
and this is according to the Rybinski theory of uh, factor growth. So from there, we can provide uh, an explanation, uh, which is a proof to the theory that number one, for commodity prices to remain constant with the growth of one factor, it means that the factor prices then must also remain constant. Because remember that firms uh, set a price in relation to their input prices. And therefore, if the commodity prices are to remain constant, it means then that the cost of production for the firm must have also remained constant. And therefore, the factor inputs must have been constant. And with that, we know that for factor uh, prices to remain constant, this can only happen if the capital labor ratio and therefore the productivity of labor and capital also remained constant in the production of both commodities. So remember how this is happening, that when we had the capital labor ratio, we noted that if we are increasing the labor in relation to the capital or we are increasing labor more than we are increasing the capital, we will notice that the productivity of labor will reduce because we will have more labor compared to the capital in the production process. And as such, because we have more labor, it means labor becomes less valuable to a firm because it's in abundant, in abundant uh, units. And as such, the returns or the payment to the labor will be declining. And the same will happen if it was the case of capital. Therefore, if we are to keep those returns not to decline, if we are to keep them constant, it means then that this labor, capital labor ratio will have to be constant. That's why we are saying for, capital, for factor prices to remain constant, the capital labor ratio and therefore the productivity of labor and capital must remain constant. Okay, then we also note that the only way to fully employ all of the increase in labor and still leave the capital labor ratio unchanged in the production of both commodities is for the output of commodity Y to reduce. And this is the reason why we are noticing that if we improve the uh, input of labor, we double the labor input, we are noticing that production of commodity X is increasing by more than proportionate. And as such, we are noticing that the production of Y is falling. And this is because we are keeping the commodity prices constant, which will respond to the constant input prices. And for constant input prices to be there, we need to have constant uh, productivity rate or unchanged productivity rate. And if that is to happen, then the production of Y must fall. And therefore, there will be a substitution of labor for capital. Okay, so thank you very much for watching. If you have questions, send an email to muawelias at gmail.com. I will see you in session two, where we will continue with uh, economic growth and international trade. Bye-bye.